In the years following the First World War, naval commanders viewed the aircraft carrier as primarily a launch platform for scout planes to support the battleship, which was still the fleet's main offensive weapon. Ironically, it was an arms control agreement that gave the carrier its biggest boost in breaking out of this secondary position. The Washington Naval Disarmament Treaty of 1922 severely curtailed the construction of new battleships and their swifter cousins, battle cruisers. But since most naval strategists considered aircraft carriers to be little more than auxiliary vessels, they were far less restricted. With the only other alternative being to scrap their partially constructed battleship and battlecruiser hulls, the world's great naval powers began converting them into aircraft carriers instead. In the United States, what would have been the battlecruisers Lexington and Saratoga emerged as aircraft carriers in 1927. The 880 foot long flight decks that topped their armored hulls were the world's longest and would remain so for the next 18 years. Their 16 boilers generated 180,000 horsepower, giving them an amazing top speed of 33 knots. A 33,000 ton vessel uh, that could go 30 knots or more uh, was very impressive, not only in what it could do to avoid enemy submarine threat, for example, but, but even more so, it gave it a flexibility in generating wind over the deck to operate airplanes with, uh, with a lot higher weight and performance. But the most impressive thing about the Lexington and Saratoga was their formidable offensive capability. With each ship carrying an air group of just over 80 fighters and bombers, they could send a significant striking force well over the horizon, far beyond the reach of even the mightiest battleship guns. In January 1929, during a mock attack on the strategic Panama Canal, the Saratoga proved this capability by performing what would become a milestone in aircraft carrier tactics. In command was now Admiral Joseph Reeves, who was anxious to put his Langley experience to the test. Reeves separated Saratoga from the rest of the battle fleet and maneuvered her away from the target area. The defending force searched in vain for the missing carrier. Two days later, Saratoga changed course, making full speed towards the canal. Reeves again defied convention by ordering his 83 planes to be launched in the pre-dawn darkness, 200 miles out at sea. Arriving over their targets at daybreak, the strike force achieved complete surprise. Had it been a real attack, the strategically vital canal would have been crippled before its defenders could mount an effective defense. Admiral Reeves' innovative maneuver demonstrated the true potential of the aircraft carrier as an independent striking force. Although the Lexington would not take part in the Midway Battle, she would play a vital role in a preliminary action, the Battle of the Coral Sea. Lexington had been laid down as a battle cruiser in 1921 and converted during construction. She emerged as America's first fleet carrier and one of the largest aircraft carriers in the world. Because Lexington was of a very early design, her available deck and hangar space was not efficiently used and her aircraft complement was a modest 63. By late April 1942, preparations for the Japanese campaign were well underway. Naval facilities at the port of Rabaul had been greatly expanded, and thousands of troops had been assembled, ready for the conquest of New Guinea and Tulagi. The troop transports were ready to sail along with their escorts of cruisers and destroyers. The Japanese anticipated little opposition on Tulagi, and once the island had been captured, the Port Moresby assault would follow. In both cases, the Japanese expected that surprise would be on their side. 
As the three Japanese aircraft carriers, which had assembled at truck, prepared to carry out their orders, one to escort the Port Moresby invasion force and the other two to take up stations in the Coral Sea, the Americans acted decisively. A task force based around the carriers Yorktown and Lexington was sent racing to intercept the Japanese. On May the 1st, south of the Solomon Islands, the carriers rendezvoused with a powerful force of Australian cruisers. The stage was set for the Battle of the Coral Sea, the first clash in an epic confrontation that would change the course of the Pacific War. The capture of the island of Tulagi on May the 3rd, 1942, was, as the Japanese expected, simply a matter of dropping anchor and disembarking the troops. Tulagi's tiny garrison of Australians had already been evacuated. The first blow in Japan's great campaign of expansion had apparently gone strictly to plan. What the Japanese did not know was that the American carrier, Yorktown, with Admiral Fletcher on board, had been informed of events on Tulagi and was already steaming north. At 7 a.m. on the morning after the Tulagi landings, Yorktown struck. 40 of Fletcher's aircraft were launched against the anchored Japanese fleet and the occupation force. In a little over an hour, the American bombers and torpedo bombers had sunk or damaged a destroyer, three minesweepers, a number of landing craft and several seaplanes. For the Japanese, it was the first unsettling evidence that American carriers lurked in the area. On only the second day of operations, events were already taking an ominous turn. By the following day, Yorktown and her escorts had returned to rendezvous with Lexington. The two escort groups now merged to form a single screen around the carriers. They had joined forces only just in time. The Japanese carriers, Shokaku and Zwikaku, had entered the Coral Sea, and the two fleets were just 70 miles apart. On the morning of May the 7th, the American carrier task force with Lexington and Yorktown was cruising on a northwesterly course. The Japanese carriers, Shokaku and Zwikaku, were sailing on a parallel course. Each fleet was unaware of the other's presence. American scout planes sent to the northeast failed to find the Japanese carriers, but a scout sent to the northwest reported a sighting. At once, the Americans launched a strike force of 93 aircraft. In fact, the ships sighted were the cruisers and destroyers of the New Guinea invasion force. But soon the carrier Shoho was spotted, only 25 miles away, and the attack was redirected. Shoho was hit by 13 bombs and seven torpedoes. She sank within minutes. For the Imperial Navy, the loss of Shoho was deeply traumatic. So shocked were Japanese commanders that the invasion of Port Moresby was immediately canceled 
and the troop ships turned back to Rabaul. On the American side, there was jubilation. A pilot's radio report of the Shoho sinking, scratch one flat top, would become the most famous signal of the Pacific War. After the sinking of the Shoho, Admiral Fletcher did not immediately launch another strike against the Japanese invasion fleet. To attack the carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku was his main objective, and in any case, the Japanese might themselves attack, and he would need his air defense at full strength. As the day advanced, a weather front closed in on the Japanese carriers. Nevertheless, the strike force commander, Admiral Tagaki, was determined to destroy the Americans before they could inflict yet more damage on the retreating Japanese invasion fleet. Choosing his best night flyers, Tagaki launched his attack in the late afternoon. The aircraft would have to return and land in darkness. The Japanese raiders, in spite of the poor weather, passed close to the American carrier group. The Americans, with the benefit of radar, easily detected the enemy formations and vectored their fighters to intercept. In a series of vicious dogfights, Ten Japanese aircraft were shot down. Eleven more would crash after the mission, trying to land in darkness. For the Japanese, the raid was a fiasco. In the aftermath of this first carrier clash between the Imperial Navy and the US Pacific Fleet, both sides considered attacking by night with their cruisers and destroyers. Both finally rejected the idea, fearing the absence of their protective screens. Instead, they withdrew, postponing the main action for another day. On the morning of May the 8th, the American and Japanese fleets were more than a hundred miles apart. The Japanese had the benefit of low cloud cover, while the Americans were exposed under clear blue skies. At 0600, both sides launched their reconnaissance aircraft, and within two hours, each fleet had discovered the other. On the American side, Yorktown and Lexington launched 70 bombers and torpedo bombers and six fighters. At almost the same time, Shokaku and Zuikaku launched 50 attack aircraft and 20 fighters. Although the Japanese carriers were close together, Zuikaku was hidden by cloud, and it was Shokaku who fell victim to the Americans. She was hit by three bombs and so badly damaged that she would later be unable to recover her aircraft. Most would be forced to ditch in the sea. The American carriers, using their radar, detected the approaching Japanese raiders 70 miles away. Twelve Wildcat fighters were scrambled, but only three reached a high enough altitude to attack and no Japanese aircraft were destroyed. Yorktown was first to be hit. A single bomb found its target. The next victim was the larger and less maneuverable Lexington. Two bombs struck her deck, inflicting minor damage. But far more seriously, two torpedoes impacted on her port side.
Even after the Japanese bombs and torpedoes had struck, Lexington continued to fight. But soon after the battle, she began to list to port. By pumping oil from one side of the carrier to the other, the crew managed to right the vessel, and she was soon capable of maintaining 24 knots. It looked as if Lexington might still be able to reach home under her own steam. However, at 1445, an explosion ripped through the carrier and soon fires were raging out of control. The order was given to abandon ship and after her crew had been taken off, a destroyer was detailed to sink the blazing hulk with torpedoes. 38 aircraft were still on board. The destruction of Lexington meant that the Battle of the Coral Sea was a tactical victory for the Japanese. The light carrier Shoho had been exchanged for the far more formidable Lexington. However, the Imperial Navy had been far more badly damaged than it seemed. The carrier Shokaku was out of action and Zwikaku's aircrew had been slaughtered. As a result, neither carrier would be able to participate in the decisive battle soon to be fought at Midway. Unlike her sister ship, the Lexington, the Saratoga actually survived the war. Here she is, docked next to her sister ship in an earlier photo, and you can distinguish the Saratoga from the Lexington based on the vertical black stripe that is painted onto Saratoga's funnel. Aside from that, Saratoga's most notable achievement during World War II was the sinking of the Japanese light carrier, the Ryusho, during the battle for the Eastern Solomons. Saratoga was also involved in a number of other Pacific campaigns, including the Gilbert and Marshall Islands campaign and the battle for Iwo Jima. During her wartime service, she was torpedoed twice, hit by three bombs and three kamikazes on various different occasions. In early 1945, she was deemed obsolete and was modified into a training carrier and would remain in that role until her demise in 1946. The atomic weapons that brought an end to the world's bloodiest conflict would have a profound influence on carrier development and determine the fate of at least one veteran warrior. In July 1946, the USS Saratoga, witnessed to 20 years of struggle and achievement, was once again called into the Central Pacific as part of a test at a small coral atoll named Bikini. It would be her last call to duty. The atomic blast that sent the Saratoga to the bottom would be an ominous portent of future difficulties in the development of the aircraft carrier. And that's all folks. Hope you enjoyed this episode on the Lexington class aircraft carriers. If you like what I'm doing, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel as I'll be putting up more videos in the upcoming days and weeks. Aside from that, I hope you all have an awesome weekend, and I'll see you all on the high seas.